Hi, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review, and we couldn't be happier to host the fourth annual Insight Jam. I want to thank everyone who's participating this week, as well as our Insight Jam sponsors, Datastax, Monte Carlo, Denoto, High Gear, and Seller Data. I also want to thank our Solutions Review editors and staff for pulling this event together. When we started this in 2019, we wanted to take a moment at the end of the year to celebrate enterprise technology with a social media event offering best practices and predictions. This will be our biggest jam ever, including 16 live streamed expert panel discussions over four days. And we intend to keep the insights flowing in 2023 with the launch of an expert subscription site for any tech professional who wants to publish posts on Solutions Review. Again, thank you all for being here and enjoy the Insight Jam. Solutions Review presents Insight Jam, a social media celebration of enterprise technology. Hello and welcome back to the fourth annual Insight Jam. I'm Jonathan Paula, the Director of Multimedia here at Solutions Review. Today's theme has been business intelligence. And for the third panel of the day, we've got another group of experts lined up to discuss data mesh, data fabric, and emerging data management approaches. I am really excited to have all six of them joining me here. But before we get to our introductions, we'd like to thank our diamond level sponsor for this year's Insight Jam, Denoto, with a quick video from them. Our thanks again to Donato for sponsoring this year's Inside Jam and Kevin, of course, for appearing on this panel. Uh, so let's kick things off with some introductions. Uh, Robert, you graciously agreed to moderate, so we'll let you go first. 60 seconds or so, please tell the audience about your Hi, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, yeah, hello everybody, welcome. Um, so Bob Eve, uh, I'm a technology advisor these days, long career in enterprise software, Oracle, PeopleSoft, Mercury Interactive. Um, in 2006, I went to a little startup called Composite Software. And we helped uh, really launch the data virtualization industry and uh, co-author, I'm the co-author of the first book on data virtualization and long time in the data management, data analysis uh, world. And today I just work with a number of companies and advising either on how to, you know, go to market in the, the data management arena or uh, how to use the data management or the data technology the integration, et cetera, in order to drive business value in your organization. So uh, just having a lot of fun and, and this great opportunity today to hear some hear from some good speakers about this topic, data mesh, data fabric, et cetera. Kevin, you're not, you're next up. You guys are the speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. So my name is Kevin Bohan. I'm director of product marketing at Denoto. I have been in the uh, integration space for over 30 years, working at a number of different vendors, both on the application integration as well as the data integration side. My focus at Remoto is creating content that allows our users to understand the best way to benefit from the technologies, how to get started and things like that. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today because it's in line with what I do each day. Uh, Andy, why don't you go next? Oh, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me to the, to the panel. So I'm Andy Petrola, so yeah, founder of Kensu, out of the Belgium now, uh, maybe the audience, in the audience. Um, well, long time in data, started as a geospatial data miner, this old term, um, working on the geospatial data, satellite, et cetera, et cetera, for some time. Implemented a data catalog 20 years ago, 
started with uh, just visual data and then moved to Spark, created the Spark Notebook as an open source software used by uh, 20,000 people back then, then created Kensu, a data observability platform to yeah, monitor and create a uh, platform that can leverage data observability at rest and in motion. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, Juan, you want to go next? Yes, I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Juan Cicada. I'm the principal scientist at Data.World and also the host of Catalog and Cocktails. It's an honest, no BS, non-salesy data podcast that we've been doing for two and a half years. With, we have a bunch of practitioners, executives going on, coming and attending. So I get to, get to learn a lot from everybody. Uh, I've been in the data space for around like 15 years. So I have an academic and industry background. So I uh, did my PhD in computer science at the University of Texas at Austin, both in databases and semantics. Uh, translated a lot of our research to startup, commercialized it. I did a company called Capsenta. I sold that to data.world, which is where I am right now. Um, I'm also author of the book, Designing and Building Enterprise Knowledge Graphs. Uh, and so I love to just go work, I to, to talk to a lot of people, understand what they're doing, and be able to kind of find the problems, bring them back to research, and, been, and, then, and then bring them back to product and just have that full cycle. So excited about this, uh, this conversation today. Thanks, Juan. How about you, Shrujan? Hey, um, thank you for inviting me to the panel. And uh, hello, everybody. I am the co-founder and CEO of the Modern Data Company. Uh, my background, I've been in the data space for the last, say, 10, 12 years, building large-scale enterprise data management solutions for large brands, large gaming companies uh, using this. Over four years ago, we started the Modern Data Company. We built what we call the world's first uh, data operating system that unifies the entire data ecosystem under one roof and creates very simple ways for businesses to start using data without worrying about the complexity of the infrastructure. Uh, really looking forward to uh, this conversation today. And yeah, thank you. Great, and finally, Khan, if you could close out for the uh, introductions this morning. Uh, yeah, hopefully you can hear me fine. Yes. Uh, name's Khan Leong and I'm co-founder and CEO of ZL Technologies based out of Silicon Valley. Been around for about 23 years uh, doing unstructured data, which I think is a little bit different from the other panelists. We've been focusing on managing uh, unstructured data like email and files for very large organizations, typically the Fortune 500. And I think our take on the issues at hand for the panel today may be quite a bit uh, different from the structured data universe. So looking forward to exchanging ideas. Great, Khan. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is a different angle than the uh, other participants. Um, why don't we start with kind of the big picture? First things first. Why do anything? Why do it now? Why are companies, so, so we'll go around the room. Um, uh, why are companies modernizing their data management environments in the first place? Is it a business driven? Is it technology driven? Is it some of both? Um, let's hear what you guys have to say. Maybe a couple of, couple of ideas as, as to what's, what's behind uh, the activity. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. Last name, Shruzan, you're first. Great. Uh, so we work with a lot of large enterprises, uh, the modern data company. And, uh, you know, the reason, one big driver I've seen why organizations are spending dollars modernizing their data stack in a lot of enterprises we work with our customers, they're spending almost 70 to 80% of their data budgets on managing the data versus actually making it work for them to drive their business outcomes. So I think the, 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 the evolution with the modern data stack, some of the data unification that's happening is gonna slowly shift that paradigm where you will start seeing a lot of commoditization of the data management and the infrastructure so that you can start focusing a lot more on driving value from data. And this is some, you know, some uh, a big trend I see uh, in a lot of uh, organizations that uh, I work with, and yeah, so that's that that's one of the big drivers I see is uh, is the the shift in budgets. It's driven by both the technology and the business teams. You need you don't have enough high skill resources to manage this kind of a complex infrastructure in house very well. So there is that as a driver to simplify the data stack. And on the other side, provide simple ways for business to start using data, create a different data experience for business teams versus the, the core data team that are managing the data. So that's another uh, angle I've seen. So more value, 
less focus on just the the, the basics. You know, try yeah, to commoditize the basics. That's great, yeah. Kevin. How about how about you? What do you see over from Denoto? Sure. Well, um, actually, last week I was talking to a, an analyst group, and they were showing a survey they did, and they. they identified that the number one driver for people modernizing their data management stack is to support modern analytics. And I think what's really dri driven behind that is there's some really good tools now, whether you're talking about visualization tools or AI and ML tools. And I think that what's happening in the industry, at least the conversations I'm having with people, is they realize that the value that the, the, the untapped potential and the value they're getting from these analytics tools is mainly because they don't have access to quality data. And some of the problems around that and why they don't are um, data silos and the information being locked up in a whole lot of different systems. Um, the new regulations and people being concerned around the, um, the who can have access to and the whole approach of the need to know only basis. But then by default, what they're doing is blocking out whole data sets as opposed to just the information that might be sensitive, like a social security number and things like that. Um, and the data teams, because this is complicated stuff, is stretched thin, so they're just not able to get at the information. So <clears throat> I think what the focus is, is if they're able to now simplify it, and like um, it was mentioned earlier around the commoditization of the data manager, making it easy and automated, then they're going to be able to provide that data to the users and be able to achieve that data-driven uh, goal that they're looking for. So that's what we're seeing in the conversations. And I think that's the um, direction that a lot of organizations are now realizing the investment has to go into improving the input of the data that will ultimately improve what they're able to get out of these investments made in the analytics uh, platforms. So tying Shruzan talked about value. You're saying that the analytics are the way to the value, but you need the data to get to the analytics and exactly. kind of that, get that supply chain going. Con, um, Unstructured data, that has to be part of the equation. Um, I assume you'll talk about that. So, but what do you see out there when you're dealing with companies that are modernizing their data stacks, their management, and what's driving them? What are they looking for? Well, in our space, it's a little bit different in that there is no choice. Every organization must modernize. Um, the first order of business in terms of unstructured data, like emails and files, is that they have to uh, satisfy their obligations for e-discovery, for compliance, surveillance, monitoring, for records management, lifecycle management, for privacy, and so forth. These are not non-negotiable. They have to be done. And now, having done that for the last uh, two decades, most uh, of the enterprises are now scratching their heads and saying, okay, I've got all of these silos all over the place. Now, how do they, I get them to act as a team? Uh, it's very similar to what happened with ERP back in the day when finally the silos unified into one platform. One interesting thing happened recently, and that is that when people looked at the silos of unstructured data, they suddenly realized that there was a, a huge value to it in that they're all human-generated, human-created, human-consumed. So if you're able to harness all of the unstructured data across the enterprise, you've basically got the beginnings of uh, organizational memory and intelligence. So that's the big thing, Vista opening up for us. Wow, so like a whole new value proposition might be derived uh, and along the lines that Kevin was talking about the analytics, but really you're saying there's a whole new class of uh, analytics that might be possible off of the unstructured data, as well as just the, the requirement Actually, it extends even beyond that, and it does affect the structured <clears throat> data universe also in that structured data typically today has not really concerned itself too much with governance. As I said, e-discovery, records management, privacy, and all the rest of it uh, in, slight, in tangential ways maybe. Now the analytics side is saying, hey, you know what? The lawyers are getting smarter. They're going into the repositories and saying, oh, wait a second. Let me take a look at this data, that data, for litigation, for other reasons. And suddenly there's a need for an oversight for governance over anything going into analytics repositories. That's a brand new development. And I suspect that in the next year or two, both uh, information governance and analytics will converge. Andy, what's your point of view 
Uh, what are you seeing going on? Um, does it build upon what Khan, Kevin, uh, Shrujan have talked about, or you see something a little different? You ask for me, right? Yes, Andy. Yeah, because I thought you were following the alphabetical order, so I was <laughs> thinking, who wants to come next? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was surprised. Okay. Um, okay, my take on this is uh, back in the days when I was a data miner, thing is that there are not that many people that were actually aware that we can do some of the things with data. So I had like maybe a few stakeholders that were coming with, okay, can we do this with data? Right? Oh, yeah, sure, probably, right? So let me check it out, check it out right? Um, and most of the time, actually, because I started to understand better and better in the domain, so I could propose new projects and stuff like this. So we were like a hand, handful of people that could do something with data. But nowadays, actually, it's kind of reverse, right? We have pretty much everybody knows that we can do something with data. So their question comes back now, oh, can we do this with data? So we have this question again and again and again. So in my opinion, it's an effect of scale. When I say scale, it's not big data, right? So which is the area of uh, 2015, whatever. Um, but it's really an effect of scale of demand and awareness. So people are asking for it. So that's one component, in my opinion. And the other one is the availability. Again, back then, I was using Fortran and R and a little bit of Java in order to put something out. They took forever to put out, but there were not that many expect expectations actually to deliver fast because the business was not actually running on my, on my output only to, to run. But nowadays, it's shif shifting also. And we have the component technologies and so on and so forth available now, Python and the, and the Spark and the like, right? Data fabrics that we'll talk about afterwards in order to speed up everything. So now that we have so many demand, that we have something available, we have to stitch uh, the offer and the demand um, now, or actually the competitive advantage a company had will not actually uh, remain. Great, thanks Andy. Uh, it's really interesting to think about the idea that we've gone from you know, a limited uh, set of consumers to a broader set of consumers and the art of possible has become much more significant. Uh, Juan, why don't we close out this question with, for, with you? Um, you know, what's the drivers? What's, why are people modernizing uh, their, their, their data management environments? What do you see? Yeah, well, it, it, it's both, right? Business and technology, but I would say it should be because of business, right? We're now talking about digital transformations. We need to have data-driven organizations, make better decisions. And I'd like, I'd like to see it from like a defensive and offensive point of view. So if we look at it from a defensive, I think that's where the focus has been and will always continue being in this, in this offensive mode, risks, compliance. And if you look at governance, like if the analogy is like, why do we have brakes in a car? Oh, it's to slow us down. So we can slow down. But if you look at it also from an offensive point of view, it's like, well, we need to get more value from our data. And then if you look at it from a governance point of view, it's like, oh, I want brakes in the car so we can drive fast safely. So I think we have to have these two different uh, uh, points of view when it comes to from the business on how they can get value to the data. But hey, let's be honest, more often than not, I think we just focus too much on the technology. And, and uh, yeah, the cloud is great. It makes easy everything easier, less things to go manage. I mean, imagine nowadays we can set up a Snowflake a database, click, click, clickety clack, and I'm done. Ready? Imagine doing that before ten years ago. Too much time. Too much time. Like now, it's super, super easy. So the cloud has taken us. A, that's great. Modern. We, I, I like to say, honest. We've got about fancier UIs to go do these things than before. Uh, but at the end, I sometimes believe that we focus too much on the technology. We just get too much into the details and we forget about the business value. So um, focus on the money. All of this, we live in a capitalist world. We need two things, make money, save money. That's what needs to be driving everything. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I like the driving analogy, the brakes, make money, save money. Very clear, Juan, very clear. Um, I thought about kind of drilling a little bit into the technology, but I think you made a really good point, um, uh, Juan, about the importance of just, you know, make money, uh, save money. Um, so let's really talk about the changing technology. Um, one thing each as to why the technology, what, what's enabling some of these new capabilities into the market before we talk about the fabric and, and, and the uh, mesh per se. What would just be one technology that, uh, we'd, uh, uh, that, that you see kind of helping it with these breakthroughs? Uh, this time we'll, we'll go alphabetical based on company names. So Juan, that, that puts you in the, in, in the driver's seat. All right. I, I like how you're mixing this up on the alphabetical order here. Um, so I'll say... Um, 
it's not for us for us at data world and what we're seeing over time is when it comes about knowledge graphs I'm, I'm, i wrote this book about design and building enterprise knowledge graphs and knowledge graphs are really about representing the real world concepts and the real world relationships it happens to be in the form of a graph and we use this to be able to go integrate data from so many diverse sources and the thing is that this is built on so much of the different technologies that have existed for a while we're building on the shoulders of giants for the last 50 plus years, right? Most recently on semantic web technology uh, stack. And what this enables us is to really integrate data from the structured side, from the semi-structured side, and even from the unstructured side, right? If you do an NLP processing, uh, your everything ends up being triples in a graph, you want to be able to go do that. Now, what we're seeing is that the great, the easy way to go applying this technology is starting with the metadata. Because metadata is much more easier to have an agreement on what the semantics mean behind it, right? You think about a database, you have a tables, columns, a database, a table is part of a database, the columns are part of a, data, a, a table, and so forth. And the amount of data is actually smaller when we think about it, and connecting data becomes a little bit easier. If we, if we're talking about uh, metadata and lineage and all these things, uh, people are, it's a graph. So I think the right. knowledge graph is something that we're seeing as kind of that very key technology advancement, that, which is going to enable what we're going to talk later about fabrics and mesh. All right, audience. Takeaway number one, learn more about knowledge graphs. Kevin, Donato, uh, second in the alpha list. Go ahead. I fully agree on the uh, concept just shared there. And what I was thinking is along the same lines is around metadata. And the shift in what was traditionally just the passive metadata around the information and the data that you're working with, but now the shift towards active metadata and how are the systems being used what are the users doing when they're active, uh, accessing the systems and using that information to automate uh, or make recommendations for the users? So you see that in a number of different ways. So you can dynamically build the data catalog so users can find the information more easily. You can use that type of information to automate the uh, data ops, um, as pointed out too, around the semantic layer and understand the data and how the data interrelates with one another. So the metadata and making that shift towards active metadata to help drive that automation and the simplification of data management, I think is a big driver of what's taking place today. All right, check box number two, everybody. Active metadata, learn about it. Uh, let's go, Andy. Uh, Kensu would be next in the alphabetical company order. <laughs> Thank Give you. Give us a technology. Uh, yeah, so I'd say that now that we have skill, well, data pipelines work, we have plenty of people that can work very fast on, on different uh, technologies and so on and so forth, right? So what's in, getting interesting is how to make sure that we're not spending too much time and money on maintaining them and monitoring them and, uh, and of course, um, cleaning them when something goes wrong, right? So basically, it's like the total cost of ownership when something is developed, right? And I like the idea of knowledge graph because in a graph, we always think about the nodes that are part of the graph, but most of the knowledge is in the edges, how we connect things together. So what I am find interesting these days is what I do, which is with Kensu, which is data observability, which is concentrating on what happens between data. And this is where a lot of knowledge is happening, where we have data that is consumed in order to produce data. And when something goes wrong, right, it's likely because there is something between two data sets that has some problem where we require people to take a look at and to find out how to fix it. So that takes a lot of time, right? And, um, and that's something I believe that the more we scale, the more uh, we will have uh, the need to, uh, to lower the cost of, of this specific ownership. So data observ data observ Say it, Andy. I ob data I, observability. Yeah, observability. Yeah, it, 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 right. <laughs> wow. But I'm writing um, it, so that's why I can spell it correctly and write it very often. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I think monitoring all the activity around the data and and highlighting the problems, right? Because it goes back to the original eighty twenty or seventy thirty um, that that, that Shujan brought up. This idea that you know if we can find these issues between the data, we can, you know, knock them down and, uh, uh, and then really improve operations, improve insight. Um, okay. Based on the alpha names, Shrujan, you're next. Great. Um, I agree with everything, you know, Juan, Kevin and Andy said about, you know, knowledge graphs, observability, you know, uh, aspects like that. What, 
you know, we see on top of that is, you know, the, the kind of uh, efficiencies that we have in the software development lifecycle, data does not have a lot of that today. And, you know, pushing towards treating data like software, uh, being able to use all of these capabilities like the knowledge graphs, the observability, the active metadata management more efficiently from a data developer perspective needs a lot more focus on treating data like software. And that's one thing that is going to help a developer use all of these underlying capabilities easily. And then the second thing that I'm seeing is start more from outcomes when it comes to using data versus starting from what data do you have and then drive towards an outcome. So these two, you know, are for me, you know, some key aspects, you know, on top of what uh, was said by the other panelists. So the kind of data software development lifecycle, that process rigor and uh, 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 scalability that would come from that rigor, and then also yeah. working backwards from the outcome. So two really process centric ideas. So, yeah. you know, guys, uh, spend some time on your processes. Check box number four. Yeah. Five con, let's close this out from ZL. You got, what's the, uh, what, what would you say a technology that's kind of helping this helping with this breakthrough occur Kanye on mute yeah my answer is a little bit more high level and more encompassing okay so you'll forgive uh, the the change of perspective i think there was an interesting concept that slipped in about the data lake however that hasn't panned out too well and what we're seeking to do is redefine the data lake and we see major uh, uh, changes in a making every drop in the lake manageable and controllable b make it virtual c merge the metadata with the original data. They have to be going back and forth at will. With these, you completely re de redefine data management. I'm speaking from the <clears throat> unstructured data cons uh, side, so you'll forgive the differences, but that is where our customers are already headed, and they include some of the largest institutions, uh, banks in the world. Now, with this kind of control and the power of governance and analytics in the unstructured data, you can get to very, very, very insightful uh, conclusions at the touch of a button. For example, in the great resignation, it would be nice to know who is likely to quit even before they think of it. <laughs> For us, it's fairly straightforward because that is the essence of human data. And that's just the beginning. We're barely scratching the surface at the moment. And I look forward to the day, the next step where the structured data, the managed data lake, the virtualized data lake will then merge from the unstructured into the structured and will end up with something from a Hollywood scene <laughs> in Minority Report. We're there already on unstructured. If we add the structured, then you have Tom Cruise standing on that platform. All right, everybody. That was great, Con. And so in a sense, you know, the takeaway there is there's a lot of the same issues that we many people understand in, in, in structured world. Um, this, this, the ideas of maybe merging the metadata with the data and also merging the, the techniques that you use across, uh, across um, the environments is structured, unstructured, and uh, through to the analytics. And, and, and a new architecture would be required to do this sort of thing, to span these silos. And we've, everybody, I think, has slipped the silo word in at least once during their talk. And, 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 and what we see now is this, this concept now of a data fabric, data mesh, and both are hot topics. You know, Gartner, Forrester, the vendor community, it's the title of this presentation. Um, 
Let's talk first about data fabrics. Um, what's going on there? Not so much definitional. I mean, you can go online, Google, if you do data fabric, data mesh, you'll see a bunch of definitions. So let's skip that step and jump right into something more realistic and practical. What do you see? Um, why do you think these things were important? And, and what's one, what, you know, tell us a customer story. Um, and now we'll do alphabetical based on first names. Andy. That would be make you first. Talk oh about um, the idea of a data mesh with respect to what you guys are doing at Kinsu, what your customers are doing, and, and, and share a story, if you would. We start with data mesh then. I thought it was fabric. OK. Um, data mesh, yeah. So it's a, great, it's a great story. OK. Great story, actually. Um, so for who doesn't know, right? So I was reviewing the book with Zamag when he was writing it. So it was very intense work um, during, during this year. Um, there is so much to learn um, uh, on, on that topic. And what I've seen um, in, the, in the data mesh implementation is that at some point there is the notion of trust that needs to be built um, in order to ensure the data products are, um, are efficient and create value, right? <clears throat> Pretty much like any product, right? So in order to use a product, buy a product, you need to have uh, some kind of uh, confidence uh, that it's actually going to do the work for uh, for for you, and you're going to generate uh, value, and actually is going to uh, uh, pay the, the the back. So, um, so that's generally a, a great challenge, and we've heard about knowledge graph, and we've heard about the data, etc. There is something that is important also um, is to automate as much as possible. Um, most of the discovery where something is actually going fishy with it, with a product. Um, because otherwise a data product will not be efficiently being used. So there will be a lot of effort to produce data product, but no one but the producer will be using because there is no trust in the data product, but only by the person who produced it, right? There is a notion of trust. Okay, this product is super good, it's super useful, so we can share, we can reuse it, right? And, uh, and uh, yeah, th therefore, excuse me, uh, therefore, uh, the discovery and uh, and the control of the of the not only the quality but the health general right of the of the data product is uh, is really important concept that we've seen uh, with Custer. Trying so, to implement so, it. So, yeah. so this life almost a life cycle element to a data product and thinking about things um, from the not just the creation at point but the uh, you know, automate, uncovering the automated discovery, the creation of that data products, the maintenance and ongoing um, uh, uh, adjustment and adaptation of that data product. Um, Juan, what do uh, you think about the concept of data fabric and your customers um, and, and your technology? Where do you see, you know, what, what ex do you have some examples that you could share of, of someone who's, uh, you know, made it happen? Yeah, so from a data fabric perspective, I, I do want to clarify, there's so many words and stuff around the, the meaning of it. I honest, no BS, what I call it, it's fancier data integration today, <laughs> but where metadata, semantics, and not even knowledge graphs play a key central role, I think that's what's the difference from before, right? Because I think before we were just doing data integration, which is just, hey, ETL in the warehouse, and now metadata is at the center, and metadata is actually going to help us automate more, more things. Um, so I think that that's the key thing. So with that, having said that, I think uh, the change that we're seeing is actually start with metadata first, and then you go off and help you go do, do, do your data integration. So a very concrete example here, uh, one of our customers is uh, Vopac. Uh, Vopac is a very large kind of oil and gas company. They, are, they do uh, tank storages. Uh, they, store, they store oil. and uh, They have tanks all over the world. And they, they were doing kind of, let's call it the old school uh, data integrations approaches, and they wanted to go change and print, bring in the fabrics and the semantics. I call this the crawl, walk, and run. So crawling is, let's go do metadata first. Uh, understand what, what you have right now. How big is your mess? And let's go on and fix, let's understand what that is. Prioritize what's in there. Provide the, the types of governance that is needed from that. Walking is out, I need to go access my data because just having just a pure metadata layer is not enough because you've got to go use the data. It's like uh, buying something on Amazon and putting in the shopping cart, but then you have to actually go drive to the store and pick it up. Like, no, I expected it to arrive to my, to my house. So uh, the walking is actually 
you use technologies such as virtualization and so forth to be to actually now I find the data I want to go access it. And then a running, the kind of the next step is where you now put in all that semantic layer where you can say, oh, I've I've, I found this data, but it's very inscrutable. It's super complicated. And my business doesn't know how to understand it. They have to have this big gap. And if you go talk to the engineers behind it, the semantic layer comes in that running step where they say, oh, this is that ontology, that semantics, what it means. We can map that, those mappings, those transforms are more metadata. And now we can enable you to go access that data in terms of the semantics instead of that inscrutable data. And I'm here kind of preaching to the choir, Robert, all the, all, all the stuff that you've been doing right, for a long time. Same thing, Ken with Gimardo. I think that is kind of the progression that we're seeing. So long story short, start with metadata, crawl, walk, and run. Metadata is at the center of data integration today. That's what data fabric is. Great. Well, glad to see the fitting in that commercial for vir uh, data virtualization, Juan. So that's definitely going to bring up Kevin next. Kevin, um, um, data fabric, um, how, 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 how are the... Denoto customers, you know, uh, addressing this problem. What are they? What are what are they doing? How are they using your product? I mean, give us an example. Tell us a story. Sure, and I think Juan set it up perfectly. And as he said, it's a, it's around starting with the metadata. You learn about the information you have, and then by virtualizing access to it, you make it a more agile approach, and all of that. So, fully agree with everything Juan was saying. Um, the goal and what we see when people are starting on this uh, endeavor to say, okay, we're looking to go past what we've been doing with um, our data management and uh, bringing it to the next steps as they're maturing and adopting the uh, data fabric. They're looking to really uh, get more agility and flexibility out of their data management. They're looking to make sure they get the right data in the right format as efficiently as possible. And as people start adopting cloud and you start to have these different distributed environments, that efficiency part's very important as well because now um, there's cost implications depending on how you go about the different integration and things like that. So um, there's a lot of implications around that. One of the customers that we work with and help them implement their data fabric was uh, Estes Express Line. If you're not familiar with them, they're the largest privately held um, freight transportation company in North America. So they deal with in the US and Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, throughout North America. And um, they had a goal to be able to provide more visibility into where the shipments were happening throughout the entire um, you know, process, sort of the way that FedEx has also been able to do with you know, your small packages. They wanted to be able to do this for any of the shipments happening for anyone happening within inside of the organization. The problem they had was they had this traditional uh, data landscape, the ETL processes. They had different teams responsible for creating the different ETL jobs uh, to be able to bring that data into a central location. There was um, duplication of effort between the different teams. They had problems around uh, multiple versions of the truth. So now that you're bringing in and having different teams pull data, they might be pulling data about the customer from different locations. And if the data is not accurate, that was taking a lot of time to resolve. Also the physically moving of the data into a data warehouse, um, that, uh, that too was basically stopping them from meeting that goal of real time, uh, real time visibility into where the shipments were. So what they did is they've implemented a logical data fabric over all of the data, whether it was still with inside of their on-premises systems or what they've been adopting in the cloud. And by taking that logical approach that Juan just mentioned, what they did is they eliminated that need to be able to create those ETL jobs, eliminated the need to replicate the data and move it into a central location. So right off the bat, it became more real time. What they were also able to do is um, by presenting the data in these business friendly views, they were able to empower more of this self-service. So it freed the data teams from having to uh, service every request for a new data source, for a new data uh, location, uh, new data report, and allowed the end users to be able to do that. A key part of that was again, using that metadata and uh, having access to a data catalog 
which was automatically generated from the system. So now users can go to a data catalog. It's like shopping on Amazon where they have recommendations provided to them based on the metadata and that of what data sets might be of interest to them. But also they can do a search, find the data. They can see the lineage of the data. So is this coming from the sources of data that they wanted? And they had all of this. So there's more trust in the data. And once you start having more trust in the data, you also then start having the acceptance and adoption of the technology as well, because you can put the greatest technology in if the users don't accept it, you're not Thanks, going very yeah. far. That's the true. other thing that was really important, and um, I think Andy was the one that brought it up around um, thinking of data as uh, software or as technology, not just data. Um, one of the key aspects they did here, because what they were looking to do is make this data available, not only in an analytics report, because a customer is not going to come to a visualization tool, but surfacing all of this data via APIs and making it available via things like GraphQL, where- uh, Kevin, how... Kevin, we got a <clears throat> okay. transition here. Okay, yep. Thank you. So basically we've, we've talked to summarize so far, we've got a lot of silos, um, a great way in, and even more silos, a great way to start to think about in these kind of fabric ideas is first understand the metadata across the silos, try to create a semantic layer that's common, uh, virtualized, and then, uh, and, and then you'd be able to do a lot from that point. Um, uh, Con, um, let's go with you. Uh, as you guys you've, have been involved in this concept of fabrics with your customers, and, and where are you? Uh, and what's, what would be an example? Yeah, <clears throat> before I get to the, ins the insights we, der we derive from our space on the mesh <clears throat> and the fabric, uh, I'd like to make one side comment on the multiple feedback I heard on, with regard to metadata. <clears throat> Metadata is extremely powerful, but it's not sufficient. As I said before, you need to alternate between the original data and the metadata. The metadata in our minds is really a priori needs. You have to guess what your future needs are because that metadata will have to serve you. If it doesn't, too bad. You have to go back and re-examine the original data anyway. And that's a mountainous uh, pile of data. So you need to have both a metadata access and also original data access uh, 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 transferable between one and the other. Now, with regard to the data mesh and fabric, I don't see a difference between the two. They merge one into the other, and they necessarily have to merge one into the other. I'll give you one prototypical example. A very large bank with over 50,000 file servers across the world uh, wanted some control over it, had lost sight of what the heck was in it, and certain issues like PII identification and control came up. So they said, came to us and said, we have over 50,000 file servers scattered across hundreds of countries. Can you help us? And we said, okay, what do you want done? Well, we want to identify the PII. We need to remediate if we need to. We need to understand what the policies of retention are by country because they're all in autonomous. And <clears throat> while we're at it, we also want to have a centralized control so that we can have uh, overrides if necessary, and also uh, 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 implement life cycle changes if we so need. And we want to do this all this virtualized. And oh, by the way, we have this data residency requirements for GDPR uh, issues. And it's like, holy cow, you've got both the data mesh and the data fabric here. They got interweave it. one into the other. You, for, for data residency, it's obviously closer to the mesh. For centralized control, it's obviously a fabric with federation. And so I don't think it's uh, that helpful to, uh, to isolate one uh, black and white concepts like data mesh and data fabric. I think that's a great point, Con. You're talking about very complex situations, critical requirements must have, uh, you know, uh, and if you don't do it, you know, you, somebody's going to go to jail. And then, uh, and don't, don't get so hung up on this definition versus that definition. Take, take these principles that we've talked about, metadata, uh, for example, knowledge graphs, for example, um, unstructured structured data, virtualization, and bring them together. Uh, Shrujan, why don't you um, kind of take this uh, from, from you guys' point of view, the modern data company, yep. about this idea of, of fabrics. Based on time, we probably won't 
to spend a, too much time on fabric versus mesh and all that definitional stuff because, and again, you can go online to read that. What I want to hear is, you know, what, what sure. what's really happening out there in the real world and, 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 and what's enabling success? Absolutely. So before I get into the fabric versus mesh, taking a step back, most of the customers we work with, you know, they still run a lot of their business operations off of mainframe systems, Excel files, text files, etc. In addition to some of the more modern lake houses, data lakes, etc. Right. So, and pretty much every customer we work with has some sort of a multi-cloud strategy. They're not just a you know, single cloud, uh, you know, a customer. When you have that kind of a fragmentation. I believe what data fabric, uh, the design pattern is allowing organizations to do is get consistency. Consistency across all of these underlying formats and clouds in how you access the data, how you discover the data, how you govern data in the same way. You know, How can you govern an Excel file or an Oracle DB or a SQL server the same way as some of the more modern systems with row-level filtering, redactions, you know, masking, all these new principles applied. So that is where I see the value of a data fabric coming in is giving that consistency in how you manage a fragmented uh, ecosystem. Knowledge graphs are absolutely one of the core essence of you know, how this gets done. And if you maintain the, the metadata and the knowledge graph right, you can make the typically you know, uh, typical fragmentation in your data stack a lot more interoperable through the knowledge layer. So that's one thing that I see. What our customers also do by getting that kind of consistency and reusability of their data stack is start you know, uh, providing better tools for business users, for domains to, to able to start create their own data products. And then we've introduced a concept of a data contract where you know, now the business users can define what contract terms do I need uh, for this data to be actually useful. So when we create a customer 360 for our customers, domains define their own domain entities, a business chains all of that to create a customer 360. Now let's say if the finance wants to use that data for reporting, they need the freshest data. They need data coming from the right source. They need the quality to be above a certain standard. These are the things that you can start defining. It's kind of like the data mesh approach where the domains create their products, the business users can add these contractual terms around it, and because of all this data fabric sort of an architecture, which is unifying and simplifying access, you can start delivering data against these contracts. So the business users are always working with high quality trusted data, which is fully in audit compliance law. So that's kind of how our customers you know, are bridging the gap between a fabric and a mesh. <clears throat> so fabric is the enabler. Mesh to me is more people process and technology, not just a, a technology play. Because there's a lot more organizational you know, changes that need to happen. Well, uh, Shrujan, I, I think you really brought a lot of the concepts together that the other folks talked about is in some ways we have these silos and it, it, it is inconsistent and it's different and distinct. And and maybe and through the metadata, we kind of find the commonalities and we find um, the opportunity for consistency. And, and that almost starts to, and then you have the metadata, the consistent definitions, semantic layer, uh, virtualized views and, and, and access. Um, that provides that consistency and, and that almost defines the idea of a fabric. And then now that we've created some, com, you know, some consistency, we can then get back to personalization or domain specific needs because my 360, versus your 360, or, or at least my 270 is different than your 180, you know, is different yep. than, and then Khan's, you know, uh, 720, because he has to do, unfortunately, he has to do unstructured too, poor guy. Uh, yep. um, so anyway, it, it's really, so that's a nice way of thinking about this, um, almost a, a fabric below and, and a mesh above, but, but consistency and, and commonality below and then flexibility and agility above. I, I really like that, how all the ideas have sort of come together. Okay, so we've got just a few minutes left. Um, rather than drilling down even more on that, give us one, let's go through and just get one practical implementation device. Because if I was listening to this, I'd be going, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. That sounds good. You know, I've got my checklist of technologies I need to learn more about. I'm all ready to go. And then it's like, wow, okay, this is big. This is going to be hard. 
where do I start? How do I do that? How do I lead a charge in my company without taking personal risk? So why don't we just close out um, um, with, with the kind of a one tangible piece of pragmatic implementation advice, something that you know, or you've seen work really well. Uh, Juan, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, so uh, I started out saying follow the money. So that's what we need to go do. And I think the practical advice here is we need to have a shift from just data literacy to what I've been calling business literacy. We need to really educate everybody within the organization how the business works so they can be more critical about it. Uh, it, it, we, we, we need to make sure that everybody's doing data work and buying technologies and stuff. They're, they know how this is connected directly to the strategic goals, to the OKRs, to your KPIs. And if you can't do that, I'm sorry, you probably have to go prepare your resume because you're going to be on the short, you're, you're, not, you're not looking good in given this macroeconomic situation. I think that's the big shift around that. So please ask why, why, why around these things. I think other kind of very practical advice is if we're going to start treating data as a product, We've defined this framework, they're called the ABCs. D data as a product needs to have accountability, boundaries, contracts and expectations, downstream consumers, explicit knowledge. I, I can give a whole talk about this stuff, but uh, just Google uh, data product ABCs to go get practical advice on how to go, how to, how, what does that mean to us? And that you can drive directly to revenue. Make money, save money. Great. That, that very concise one. Thank you so much. Uh, Kevin, what? Concise, practical counsel. Sure. So I think the a key thing, and you mentioned it, people are, I think, intimidated by the scope that might be involved if you're talking about a big organization and all of their data. So following Juan's advice of follow the money, look at the specific data domains that you have. Identify a few that by bringing these together, starting to have better control over those, that you're going to be able to deliver this successful business outcome and have that justify them the additional investments, they'll get to a point after you do several of these projects that you're at a tipping point where you have a good portion of the enterprise data there, where you can then start looking at it enterprise wide. But to try to boil the ocean um, okay. is just not practical. So that going back again to one of the comments Juan made earlier, it's either crawl, walk, run, and you look at this from a pragmatic approach of where the biggest bang for the buck's going to be and start there. Start small and expand out over time. And, and success breeds success. Then now all of a sudden you get more people on board, more resources, that Absolutely. sort of thing. Andy, Andy, how about you? What do you, what do you, what are you thinking when it comes to practical advice? Practical advice, <clears throat> I always like to manage expectations. Um, when you grow the project, actually it's good to know what are the expectations and they are shared and understood and can be managed and monitored in order to maintain the level of trust across the board, not, not only the, um, the business, of course, stakeholders, but also the people who will have to put uh, everything together to satisfy the business and their thing. So um, yeah, manage expectations, set them, monitor them, validate them at the lower cost, of course, right? So I have dedicated a full chapter on this concept of expectations in the book that I'm writing at the moment, Fundamentals of Data Absolutely right. for Early, right? So. Uh, for me, it's one of the big struggles that I have been facing along the years. Build something, deliver something, and at some point, the expectations were not met because they were not set before. Got it. Got it. That's really good. Get in front of it. Get in front of it. Con, um, what do you got? What uh, some would be a piece of practical advice, uh, success factor? Okay. Uh, before I get to the advice, I'd like to make one comment about the uh, CIO. Okay, I let's think, keep it short, Con. We were yeah, really sure. running near the end of time. Yeah, the CIO should be renamed Chief Infrastructure Officer, and there's ah. a new there's a new position that needs to be filled, and that's the Chief Information Officer, the real one. Because uh, my my piece of advice is, before you get started, understand there are so many different uh, stakeholders there. You need to get them all at the round table, and you should start an information management committee consisting of all the stakeholders, like the general counsel and legal the chief compliance officer, the chief uh, risk officer, the chief data officer, and of course, IT. Otherwise, great. you're going to be running in circles. No, I think that's great. You know, and we talk about business first and, and, and follow the money. I mean, these are the people that are running the business and know where the money is. Shrujan, uh, practical advice. Yeah, so I'll tell you a couple of things I tell all of our customers. Number one, start with outcomes. Don't start with your data. Define clearly what you want to get done with your data and then work backwards. Don't start with what data I have. 
And the second piece of advice or, or that, I, that we talk to our customers about is lifting and shifting and just data migration does not equal data modernization. There's a lot you can do with your data first and only intelligently move what needs to be moved so that you reduce your risk and cost uh, in your data implementation. So these are some of the two things that we can keep talking to our customers about. Yeah. Great. Well, that was great, everyone. Thank you so much for the insights. Uh, I see Jonathan coming back on, so that means it's time to close it up. Love, I, we could go on for hours, as you know, but uh, Jonathan, take it back over. Uh, yes, thank you, Bob, and thank you to the rest of our panelists. This is a great discussion to listen to. Um, as we wrap up the show here, I'd like to invite each of you to take 30 seconds or less, uh, and I want to stress less, uh, to <laughs> just uh, do some... Uh, a Twitter account, your uh, company solution, whatever you'd like, the floor is yours. Uh, Robert, we'll come to you last and uh, give you the last word. So uh, Kevin, you're up first. Okay, so um, basically I would encourage anyone that's interested in this topic to reach out to Denota. You can reach out to me directly either on LinkedIn or send me an email um, or just go to the Denota site and there's a button you can say, talk to an expert. But we have over 20 years experience doing exactly what we're talking about here, helping companies modernize their data management. So talk to us. We have the experience. We can help you get going and describe and define for you how to be successful doing that crawl, walk, run type of scenario. So I would encourage anyone that's interested in the topic to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Andy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So check out on cancer. So again, like um, Kevin, so you can reach me out on, on, on LinkedIn, my email, on our website. So on the website, actually, you can register to our community edition where you can have access to uh, 2.5 gigabytes of data observation for, for the year. Um, there is a link to our uh, community uh, on Slack where we share experience and, uh, and knowledge about how uh, to diminish the efforts and the burden that comes with management of um, expectations um, of, of data quality and data uh, reliability. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, Juan, you're up next. Right. Um, so uh, data.world, we're the enterprise data catalog for the modern data stack. And the you know, use cases that we see that our customers are mainly around three, data discovery to democratize data, agile data governance, and cloud migration, cloud data migration. So the three types of use cases we have, a lot of great uh, stories we can tell from our customers, like lar the largest consultancy firm in the world has 20,000 consultants using data.world and so forth. Uh, reach out data.world and also check our podcast catalog and cocktails we go live every wednesday at 4 p.m we've been 100 plus episodes uh, that you can see our honest no bs take on everything that we've discussed here excellent thank you uh con and you're muted yeah um uh, if you your organization is struggling trying to get your docs lined up uh docs actually uh, and you have to uh, satisfy your legal, your compliance, your risk, your records, and your privacy, and you want to add analytics on top of it, come talk to us because you need a more co co comprehensive strategy. It's uh, zlti.com. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sir John. Yeah. So at the modern data company, like I said in the beginning, we built what we call the world's first data operating system. It is a programmable multi-cloud end-to-end data ecosystem. And our customers are able to leverage that kind of breadth in the offering with the composable nature of our architecture to realize data fabric, data mesh design patterns in a matter of four to six weeks. So this gives an enterprise an agility to try what works for them without investing in massive modernizations and then figuring out it works or not. So very ROI-driven approach quick time to value in matter of weeks versus years that it takes in other approaches. So that's, uh, you know, uh, of values of organizations that want to create a modern layer on top of their existing infra without disrupting what they do. Data OS could be a potential you know, option for them there. Uh, our CTO has been, uh, you know, uh, writing a lot about how to exactly work with, uh, work with data OS to solve these typical data problems. So, Check out Modern Data 101 on Substack. Uh, there's a lot of good content we're putting out there. You know, uh, Great. On how Thank our customers are using this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great. you and very I'll, much. And I'll close out. Just find me on LinkedIn and we can chat. Go, yeah. go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> Well, that was short and sweet. I appreciate that, Bob. Uh, thank you again, uh, gentlemen, for your time and expertise over the last 58 minutes. It has been 
uh, a great educational resource uh, for, for myself personally and hopefully for our audience. Uh, that will do it for this panel. Uh, if you're watching live, we encourage you to stick around because in about a minute and a half, we'll be back with our next group of panelists talking about mastering data integrity and data quality in the cloud age. You don't want to miss it. It is a great conversation. and We hope to see you there. Uh, once again, have a great afternoon and uh, yep. see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.